Good afternoon, everyone. This is an event called Damned If You Do, Damned If You Don't, Troubled Waters Over the Nile. Um, we're gonna have a discussion about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. I am Erica Weinthal. I am a professor at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University. And um, I will be moderating this discussion today um, with Aaron Salzberg. And I've had the pleasure of having known um, Aaron for many years at this point, um, largely um, because I've chased him through various halls trying to have a chance to interview him um, for my own research on international water over the years um, in his capacity as um, the special coordinator for water resources when he was at the State Department. I'm gonna um, do a brief introduction um, but before I do that, I want to acknowledge the co-sponsors of this event today. Um, this is an event being, that is organized um, by the UNC Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies. Um, there are lots of um, co-sponsors, including at UNC, the African Studies Center, the Curriculum in Global Studies, the Curriculum in Peace, War, and Defense, Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. Also, the Duke, um, shout out down the road, um, the Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies, the Duke UNC Rotary Peace Center, also the Georgia State University Middle East Study Center, and lastly, the Water Institute at UNC Chapel Hill. Okay. Um, so again, I see people are still coming in. Um, I will begin, um, just to get us started so we can stay on time today, I will, I'm going to um, introduce Aaron Salzberg, who I will be probing with questions, but we will also open it up to all of you who are joining today. So once again, if you have questions throughout this event, please put your questions in the Q&A. Um, and then once they start coming in, I will open it up for, you know, um, I will ask the questions um, to Aaron um, that come in through the Q&A. So just, um, the introduction could be very long, but I will try to keep it brief. Um, Aaron Salzberg is currently the director of the Water Institute at the University of North Carolina. And I have to say, as someone who is at Duke, I am just thrilled that we have him in the area um, and these opportunities to engage on water issues um, between UNC and Duke. This is just tremendous. Um, but before he came to Duke, I mean, to UNC, I just want to grab him already. Um, <laughs> and bring him out down the road. Before he came to UNC from 2010 to 2017, he served as the State Department Special Coordinator for Water Resources, where he led the development and implementation of US foreign policy on drinking water and sanitation, water resources management, and transboundary water and conflict. He was the first person to hold this title at state. Um, and over a um, period of over 20 years, um, he was often the lead representative, the lead water advisor for the United States in nearly every major international government, intergovernmental event on water, including the G8, the World Summit on Sustainable Development, the UN Commission on Sustainable Development, and World Water Forums. Um, he has worked in the Nile, but he's worked in many other basins. So I would also think, um, note that often we can ask him questions about the Nile, but also think comparatively um, the lessons learned from his other work. Um, he, um, there's so much here. Um, he has worked in the area of, um, what do I want to say? I think I will just, I'll note some fun things. He is an avid hockey player. He played semi-professional baseball. Um, he has a PhD in genetic toxicology and MS in technology and policy from, um, from MIT. He also has another degree in aerospace engineering. Um, he holds appointments at the globe, as a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC. He also serves on the World Meteorological Organization Scientific Research Board. And he has served on the Scientific and, um, Program Committee for World Water Week in Stockholm. So um, it's a very illustrious background and it will be fun to have this conversation today. Um, so I think we should just start, and I already see questions coming in. This is fantastic. We should just start with having you talk a bit about your background 
um, what it meant to serve as a special coordinator for water within the Department of State, um, especially when it came to international river basins. Well, thanks, Erica. And thanks, Erica, for doing this and for the team at UNC and, and Duke who all helped to make this happen. Um, your GERD is an issue that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, cooperation with Nile is near and dear to my heart. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk a little bit about it and all the folks that, that are come, tuning in to listen. Um, you know, at the Department of State, you, you kind of mentioned the role, which was to manage in US foreign policy. And we really got to cover the entire range of water related issues. But it, I think the most challenging part of that was, was how you get the United States government itself to prioritize and work in a thoughtful way to address international water challenges. And so while some of my job was to help support and develop and implement uh, international policies on how we deal with water, and how do we get the international system to work collectively to solve complicated water challenges? Another part of it was how do we get government to work thoughtfully on international water challenges. And, and sometimes the latter could be more, a lot more difficult than, than, than the former. Um, but it was really, it was, it, look, it's been an incredibly exciting time over the last 20 years to work on international water issues. Um, we've seen so many um, global efforts to prioritize water issues through the, the Millennium Development Goals and now the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we've seen this whole growing field of hydro diplomacy where diplomats have now gotten more engaged on international water issues. And so we're seeing different skill sets being brought to bear to try to solve water challenges. Um, and to me, that's what makes the space really exciting. And, and that was what was exciting about the work that I was able to do is that you know, any given day you wake up, you could be involved working on a water issue, a finance issue, a policy issue, a social cultural challenge. And uh, it was just a, it's just a great area to work in. So building on that, given that you had several decades working in this field in government. Um, for those you know, who may be listening today and are interested in, a in entering the field of hydro diplomacy, um, you know, what would you say to them, you know, if, you know, and it can, we'll get to the Nile, but like, even if, so if someone was interested in thinking about hydro diplomacy in the Nile, um, what did you not know that you wish you had known when you went in what, what did you, you know, what was surprising to you, um, you know, being in this field for, you know, two decades um, that just, you know, you could not have learned in the classroom. Um, just some reflections on, you know, being the point person in many of these water negotiations. Um, well, in, in fact, I kind of like to take the opposite approach when I walk into situations like that. I mean, the reality is I didn't know anything. Um, you know, you think you know things, but when you walk into a situation like that, you really don't know. Uh, the people in the countries know their situations better than anyone. And, you know, I would never think that I understood Ethiopia or Egypt or Sudan's water challenges better than they do, even down to an individual. Um, I, I'm not going to know the science or the conditions in an individual country better than uh, the minister or staff member in the, the Eastern Nile technical group or anybody like that. It, it's just not going to happen. And so in some respects, it's actually a process of trying to suspend what you know um, and don't let what you know get in the way of actually learning from the people on the ground about what's really going on and being able to you know, thoughtfully and constructively work with them to think through some of these challenges. And so from that regard, I, you know, I would argue, and I think I've always said this, the thing that prepared me most for a career, both in the State Department and in hydro diplomacy, has been involved in mediation. And uh, I was fortunate I was able to mediate in the Cambridge court system for a number of years. And that day-to-day -day practice of mediation and conflict resolution, you know, it, it helped develop my own skills of just listening, uh, listening to people, understanding where they're coming from, understanding a wide range of issues, uh, and being able to help lead a conversation. Great. Um, so we're already getting some questions coming in about um, negotiations over the GERD. Um, you know, I want to, before we go specifically into that, I just want to ask one more general question just to sort of help us frame understanding international water basins, especially one like the Nile. And you could also use this as a way to um, maybe talk a bit about 
some of the transboundary water challenges um, facing the states in the Nile, but also more generally, like what does one need to think about um, in, tr in a, trying to negotiate or mediate um, a conflict over a transboundary water um, body? You know, what are some of these, the major challenges for, um, from someone from the outside in many ways, who's not within the base, basin, who's trying to come in as a neutral party? Yeah, it is a lot of good questions. And I think I want to be clear that um, uh, negotiate, mediate, arbitrate are all loaded words. Um, and, and by and large, uh, you know, I, I, I saw my job and, and look, I was, I was really fortunate to be in a unique position where I could work with these countries in a way that a lot of people don't have the opportunity to. And uh, for me, it was just an incredible opportunity. And I have a lot of close friends in all three countries. Uh, and, and I and I worship them and the work that they do. Um, they have very hard jobs. Um, the at the end of the day, uh, though, my my job isn't to uh, solve this dispute for them. My my job is to, if I can, uh, is to help provide them with ideas or data or, or or things that can expand their thinking about these sets of issues and let them carry that thinking forward in a discussion with the other with the other parties. And so if I'm lucky, what I can do is I might, in some cases, I might be able to provide incentives by working with other donors. We might be able to provide uh, build capacity. We might be able to provide investments in infrastructure. We might be able to do things that we as large governments can do um, to help move a process along. Um, but uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, you have to follow their lead and uh, you know, the countries will often let you know where they think support is needed and how you might be able to best move that process along. And if you're lucky enough, you can become a partner with them in that process and uh, you can contribute in all sorts of different ways as time goes on to how they're thinking about the problems and things can happen and, and hopefully good things happen out of that. Great. Um, and a lot of that resonates with what I saw on the ground many years ago, too, in Central Asia um, in negotiations over the RLC Basin. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about um, the Nile Basin. Um, can you tell us a little bit, you know, about the basin, you know, who the parties are, um, you know, what, some, what their interests are, how those evolved over time, um, because interests are never stagnant in any water basin. And you know, maybe give some historical context for how the basin has been managed historically, and you know, past efforts, you know, to um, promote cooperation. Um, you know, we have you know a hundred years, of, you know, that we can go back and looking at um, you know efforts um, to manage the Nile, but just to provide some of the context. We can. It's a it's a really complicated. Um... Uh, basin and a complicated set of questions. And I'm not sure I'm going to do it all justice, but 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 I know we have people on the call who actually don't even know the basin at all and what some of the challenges are. And so so maybe that's probably a good place to start. And um, I'll pause if it's okay with you. I'll put up a quick map um, because that might be the best way to kind of talk about some of these issues. Um, but, but what you're let's see if I get this right. Um, ideally, what you're seeing right here. So here you go. Here's here's the Nile Basin. Uh, and it is arguably one of the longest rivers in the world. And there's really two parts to it. There's what we call the, the White Nile, which uh, starts down here and originates in the equatorial lakes uh, and flows north. Uh, and then what we have is a collection of river systems that we often call the Blue Nile. There is a specific tributary here called the Blue Nile, but we have a, a large set of rivers that originate in Ethiopian highlands and it, it flows uh, and joins the White Nile in Khartoum, and then it flows flows north. Um, and the the Blue Nile, these sets of rivers, really make up the preponderance of the water in the Nile Basin, and the, the flows uh, north into into Egypt. Um, the White Nile is responsible for about 15% of what flows into Khartoum, uh, but the Blue Nile is responsible for about 60%, and this entirety of these rivers, about 80 to 85% of the river flows. So. These are really significant um, river systems. Um, these three countries uh, almost couldn't be more different when it comes to their hydrology and, and their potential water use. 
Um, Ethiopia uh, is, is clearly a mountainous country. I wouldn't say it's water rich, um, but it's not necessarily water poor either. It's got about 1,500 cubic meters of water per person, which puts them above the threshold of what we would consider to be water stressed. Um, but they certainly face uh, problems when it comes to providing access to safe drinking water and sanitation for their people, enough water for irrigation purposes and things like that. Um, it's a mountainous country and so it provides good opportunities for hydropower development. And so along some of these river systems, you have great opportunities for generating tremendous hydropower. Uh, Sudan, of course, once you get out of the Ethiopian highlands, it starts to flatten. And of course, what often happens when, when you get in those kinds of systems is you start to get uh, strong, you know, great agricultural areas, right? The, 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 the river feeds uh, all sorts of lands around the river in Sudan. Uh, and, and Sudan uh, is wa more water poor than Ethiopia. Still not what we consider to be significantly water stressed, but water stressed, uh, but has tremendous agricultural potential. And we often talk about Sudan as having the possibility of being the breadbasket for Africa. And one can imagine that if we can get uh, in the water right, uh, and they, they had the supplies that they need, they could really begin to expand food production in a way that would not only spark growth in Sudan, but could actually help resolve a lot of the challenges that the continent faced in food security. Um, and then of course, these two rivers flow into Egypt, Egypt being one of the most water scarce countries in the world. Uh, I think the per capita water availability is somewhere around uh, five or 600 uh, cubic meters per person, certainly considered water stress. And, and what's uh, probably most unique about a country like Egypt is about 96, 97% of that water comes from transboundary sources. So they're heavily dependent on the water that flows from the Nile in, into their country. And so this creates a really unique dynamic um, between the countries and the system about how you might manage this river in order to provide broad uh, social and economic benefits to the region. I think the World Bank did a study, geez, almost 15 years ago, you know, where they estimated that if these countries could work together on developing this basin, you could spark economic development, two to 5% GDP for some of these countries. And so for some of these countries, two to 5% GDP growth is enough to pull them out of poverty. And so one of the things that I think excited us in the donor uh, community and other parts of the world was if we could promote cooperation in this basin, we might be able to spur development that would help pull this region out of poverty. Um, and that got a lot of folks interested in supporting cooperation in the Nile. And that process dates back decades. Um, but I'll think when it really started to gel and take some form was probably in the early 1990s uh, under an initiative called Tech Nile. I think that was UNDP and the Canadians who started that. That morphed into what we would call the Nile Basin Initiative, which was launched in 1999. Um, and that was a consortium of donors, including the World Bank and others, uh, to help not only build capacity in the basin, but identify joint development projects that would spur um, economic growth and development. Uh, within the basin. And, and, and that program went on. In fact, it still goes on today. And in fact, if you looked at the Nile Basin Initiative, I think at this point, uh, there's close to a billion dollars of investment projects that have been developed through the Nile Basin Initiative. There, the capacity of all the countries has been, has been built up. Uh, we've got a staff of about 140 people who are working to understand uh, and identify joint development projects through, through the Nile Basin Initiative. And so um, a lot of cooperative efforts and a lot of uh, investments uh, by countries throughout the world in trying to spark uh, cooperation in the basin. So given that there's been a, you know, a number of efforts, um, initiatives to promote cooperation among the riparians, um, and that, you know, the number of riparians have also expanded as, you know, um, with South Sudan um, becoming independent. Um, what, what has happened? Why are we even talking about this conflict over the, gear, the GERD, you know, about the, um, this dam in Ethiopia? What has changed? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, you know, going back to the um, going back to the map for a second. So, for, for those who don't know, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam uh, was uh, the construction started in 2011. Um, it's located. Let's see if I can actually draw it somewhere. 
let's see, right, right about so, somewhere in here, about 20 kilometers uh, from the border with Sudan. It's on the Blue Nile. Uh, the dam would produce, originally it was designed to produce over 6,000 megawatts of power. Uh, now I think that number has dropped down below 6,000 megawatts, but it would still increase Ethiopia's power production for the entire country, upwards of you know, close to 50%, if not more. Uh, and of course, Ethiopia is a country that's really challenged with providing energy services to its people, right? So there's a very legitimate need for Ethiopia to want to expand its power production to meet the growing needs for power among its population. I think right now less than 50% of the population in Ethiopia has access to um, regular energy services. Uh, but with uh, any dam comes challenges. The reservoir behind the dam would store 70, uh, about 74 billion cubic meters of water. And the storage of that water, how you fill the dam, how you operate the dam, uh, what happens during times of drought might all have impacts downstream. And those impacts could uh, be positive or they could be negative. And so that's part of what this relationship is about then. Um, how do you come to an agreement on how you fill and operate this dam uh, in order to either maximize the benefits or to at least ensure that no harm comes to the downstream countries. And so, on the surface, um, you know, the first set of discussions among countries is about water, right? It's about how you manage this dam. Well, first it's about the dam and how you manage and operate the dam. Uh, and then the second conversation is about the water uh, generally. Um, and that's where things get a little bit more complicated. Um, you know, Egypt has a law as, you know, for a millennia been using a certain amount of water. Uh, and they're heavily dependent on the water that flows across their borders. So they have a strong interest, of course, in trying to protect their water resources um, and making sure that those numbers don't go down. Now, at the same time, uh, you know, Ethiopia and Sudan uh, might have very legitimate needs to increasing their water use and water consumption. And so the real question then is how do you balance those sets of issues? Uh, but there's probably a third set of issues that underlies a, a lot of this dynamic. Um, and, and that is, I think there's a longstanding perception that uh, Egypt has uh, not been, uh, has, you know, Egypt has historically been the hegemon on the Nile. Uh, and they're the ones who've dictated what development has had and what development has, hasn't happened on the, on the Nile Basin. And the, uh, you know, there's a longstanding perception uh, that Egypt's early development of the Nile may have prejudiced some of the other opportunities for development by the upstream countries. And so there may be some longstanding animosities that exist for other reasons uh, around uh, not just the use of the water, uh, but relationships generally in the region. Great, so I'm gonna um, build off that, but um, we have a question from Shafiqul Islam, which I think in many ways um, ties into some of the questions I also had for you about impediments to getting a deal. And he asks, many have argued that trust, linkage, and cooperation can resolve the Ethiopian, Egyptian, Sudan, GERD dispute, yet we seem to be at an impasse. Um, what are the three, I guess, you know, um, critical impediments for an effective and sustainable resolution of this dispute? at least from your perspective? Um, you know, that's a, it's an, it's an interesting question. Uh, um, I, I'm not so sure that trust weighs into it too much though. Um, I think, remember these are countries and it's, it's rare that a country will put its national interests uh, and make them subject to trust or an agreement that's subject to trust, right? You, you wanna, if you're trying to protect the interests of your government and your country, you're gonna want a binding agreement or something that protects your interests in some way, shape or form. Um, if you're just basing it on trust, that's a tough thing to be able to do. Um, but there's no question that um, if the relationships within the region were different, and if uh, there was greater trust and cooperation between the parties generally, um, that that would make it much easier, I think, um, to solve this problem. But I don't think that's the case right now, right? I don't think that we have um, uh, a set of circumstances um, that would allow that kind of uh, resolution to the problem. So uh, what, what does that mean? Um, for, from my perspective, a sustainable resolution to not just this problem, but any transboundary water basin problem is really about the process. 
Um, you know, the, the, the countries, I think, can come to an agreement on what, what the terms of the filling might look like, what operation might look like. They might even be able to come to what, uh, how they share risks during droughts and things like that. Um, the most important thing that can come out of this is that the countries establish a relationship and a process for how they're going to work together to solve complicated problems. Now, the reality is that this is an incredibly dynamic basin. Um, there's a lot of variability in the hydrology, but both the needs and the uses of these countries is going to change radically over the next 5, 10, 1,500 years. And so what you really want is you want to institutionalize a process between the countries where they're sitting down on a regular basis, they're jointly looking at data, they're jointly looking at what their needs are, they're jointly discussing how they might allocate those resources and the best way to optimize the joint benefits that can generate from the water resources throughout the basin. And then that's a regular process um, that's not happening once every 10 years or once every 15 years when there's a problem. It happens on, a, on a, every six months or every annual basis. Uh, and then that, that, that relationship, that institutional process of talking to each other regularly gives them then the strength to deal with droughts and other unforeseen events that start to happen. You know, we had this process play out in the United States, of course, you know, in the Colorado, when we all thought that, um, you know, the agreements that we had in place were based on what we thought was a, was a relatively dry period, turned out to be a wet period. And the agreements that we put in place were no longer appropriate for managing the water resources that we had. Um, and so the strength of it was that, you know, we had relationships that allowed us to sit down, look at the data, talk about how we would move forward and do that in a joint way. And so I think, you know, if you're looking for a sustainable resolution, it's about institutionalizing a process of jointly working together to solve these kinds of complicated problems. And that is not the first time that I've heard you say that. And I always, you know, it, um, and I always realize how important that is because for so many of us who study international um, water disputes were often focused on the outcome, the treaty itself, and what goes into the treaty right. and the agreement. And we forget that there's something really important about institutionalizing how, you know, people come together, scientists, hydrologists, um, to manage the water system in a way that um, is continuous. And so in some ways that can be part of this, you know, I think what, um, when thinking about trust, it's about, you know, these are confidence building measures or trust building measures that are institutionalized. Maybe, I mean, it, one could look at it that way, um, but it's, it's ensuring um, that, there's, that this process works. And so I, we have a question um, that one could, you know, take this a little bit further. Um, from Yared Lema um, Harissa, who asks, um, just went on the screen, um, who asks, how do you see the neutrality of current mediating countries and their role in resolving the issue? Um, what is done to improve the existing situation? And so, you know, part of, um, is there a role for the mediator um, in facilitating this process, you know, and can that, do you need the mediator, the mediator there for the process, um, or can the you know at what point does the mediator pull out and the process exists? How do you then institutionalize it? And is you know what is happening in the Nile Basin for that, or are there other basins that could provide a good example of how this might work? Um, well, there's uh, no question that outside parties. Uh, have to work very hard to maintain their neutrality in all these kinds of processes. Um, you know, again, the word mediator is a somewhat loaded term, uh, you know, and I know the riparian countries themselves have different views of this, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think they've agreed um, to a mediated process, and as the way we would think about mediation in a traditional sense. And so I think the idea that we have outside parties who are helping to facilitate discussions um, which is a different thing, um, is, is where we are right now. Um, now, what should be done to improve the you know, existing situation? How do you make, how do you make this, um, how do you make, make that better? Um, it really depends on the parties. I mean, one of the rules of 
uh, mediating a transboundary water dispute or facilitating a transboundary water dispute is that the countries have to lead. Uh, if, if you want a sustainable outcome at the end of the day, the countries need to be able to represent the product of those discussions as their product. It was something that they developed. It was something that they did. And ideally, if you're a facilitator in that process or a mediator in that process, um, you are as uh, transparent as, as, sorry, as unseen as possible. David Gray has a great saying about that. He used to say, look, leave no footprints in the sand, right? Ideally, um, your job as a facilitator or mediator is not to be out in front, it's to be in the back. Um, and the, the, look, these, are, these are all very sophisticated, very talented, very capable countries. Um, they are capable of solving their own problems on their own. And so the role of a facilitator mediator is to help add value where the countries ask for it. And sometimes countries might ask for value either in terms of how do we do this analysis? How do we do this technical data? How would we solve this problem in a different way? Have you seen examples of that? And so for one of the things that I can bring is if um, I've been doing work on the Indus, we can talk about the dispute resolution mechanisms of the Indus and whether or not they may or may not be appropriate in this particular situation. If we're talking about how do we provide long-term protection against droughts, well, we can talk about insurance schemes that might have been used to address uh, climate change-related drought issues in Latin America or someplace else, and how those insurance schemes might be brought to bear to solve a problem like this. And so th the idea, I think, of the facility media really is about um, expanding that solution space, uh, but the sustainable outcome you, you can't, you know, you, you've got to be in the background. It's the countries themselves that have to be able to speak to that process and be able to embrace whatever comes out of that process. So this summer has seen a lot of activity um, in the region with, you know, Ethiopia um, starting to fill the dam. Um, some, you know, discussions um, faltering that were led by the U.S. Um, also, Sudan experienced lots of flooding this summer, um, and we have a question from Hadil Hamoud about that, you know, about the flooding in Sudan and how that's shifted, you know, GERD interest in negotiations. So maybe, you know, let's just go right into the summer, like what has happened, you know, in the region that may have just shifted um, the interests of the states or changed the dynamics moving forward? Yeah, you know, I think that the most profound thing, I mean, obviously, the filling was a, a critical step, right? And Ethiopia is beginning to fill the dam, uh, you know, sent a, a very strong signal um, to the other countries that, look, this process is going to move forward. Um, but the impact of that on Sudan, I think, was really quite profound. Um, uh, Sudan uh, has um, a lot to gain. Uh, and a lot to lose if they're not careful from this from this dam. The dam will regulate the water flows coming out, which will give Sudan an opportunity to increase its own power production and perhaps increase its agricultural production as well. Um, but at the same time, uh, th you know, there's 74 billion cubic meters of water that are being held behind two dams in Ethiopia, both the primary dam of Gerd, but also the saddle dam associated with it. Uh, that, you know, if you're living downstream, you're gonna wanna be assured that it's safe and sound and it won't collapse. You're also gonna to wanna to know what's the timing of the flows. Um, if I'm Sudan, if I am going to try to optimize my energy and agricultural production, knowing the timing of the releases from GERD become extremely important. And I think the, the filling event and then the flooding event um, may have woken Sudan up to some of those concerns. And what we saw was that Sudan is now playing what I think is a much more active role in the conversations going on. Uh, you know, they stepped in uh, as a uh, facilitator or mediator uh, during this, once the US talks broke down uh, to try to put things back together again during the summer. Uh, and I think they're probably a much more active participant in the discussions that are happening right now as well. And I think that's a very positive dynamic. Um, I, I think that it's, it's, um, it, it's healthy that all three countries feel that they can equally represent their issues in these discussions. So I think that's a positive dynamic. Um, the current discussions going on under the auspices of the um, African Union, um, I, you know, it's not clear to me how much prog progress they're gonna make. Um, again, I think the countries uh, 
for a long time because there's been a lot of technical conversations going on for the last 10 years. And, you know, in fact, I do think there's a great deal of respect and trust that exists between these countries at a technical level. I mean, I know, I know the ministers, I know the, the staffs, I know the people who are working in these countries, and they work closely with each other. They've spent many, many days, weeks, if not years, working with each other on, on some of these shared challenges, and there's a great deal of respect between them. Um, and I think, uh, uh, left to their own devices, I think they could come up with filling and operational regimes um, that, that would work. I, I think the outstanding questions around um, how do you distribute cost and benefits during a long-term drought, which is not really a water question, but more of a political question. Now that's a, that's a harder thing. Um, how do you address what might be uh, the feeling that there are long-term uh, reparations that are due because of the impacts of building the high Aswan Dam and managing the waters the way they've been managed for the past 50, 60 years. Those are really much harder issues to do. And I don't think those are things that the, the water folks necessarily can solve um, by themselves. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a bit because we have a question that I, I think is um, quite interesting from Andrew Simon. Um, who's asking if you could reflect on the socio-cultural dimensions of this conflict over the Nile and its management. Um, you know, he's asking as a Middle East historian, he's more familiar with what the Nile means to Egyptians, um, what space does the waterway occupy in Ethiopian culture? And I'm just going to push it a bit more, um, you know, the dam, you know, in conversations that I've had in Ethiopia too, has played a role in also thinking about Ethiopia's future and positioning itself as a green leader. So I'm just, you know, maybe, you know, both um, what it means for Ethiopian culture, but also in this broader context of how Ethiopia has positioned itself vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, taking a leadership role um, when it comes to climate change, addressing climate change. No, it's a really good question. And, um... You know, th th there's the dam and the power production and what that might mean for the Ethiopian people and Ethiopian development. Um, but there's also the, um, what the dam means for Egypt's, uh, I mean, sorry, Ethiopia's um, uh, self-determination, right? This is, this is funded by the Ethiopian people um, and it's being built by, by Ethiopians. And uh, the, there's a large sense of pride that should be taken in that kind of a project and that kind of an activity. And in some respects, I think the dam has taken, you know, has an outgrown personality, so to speak, an outsized personality. Um, it means a lot more than just the power production that it's going to produce. It's a reflection of, I think, where Ethiopia sees itself coming into a leadership role on the African continent. Um, its ability to take major steps to move its country along the development continuum and to address um, longstanding concerns. And I think there's a lot of uh, pride and um, uh, to be taken by the Ethiopian people uh, for the dam. Um, but again, I also think there's a sense of righting what might be some historic wrongs. And um, look, I, I don't think for a minute uh, that Egypt's development of the Nile or Egypt's agreements with Sudan uh, or, the, or Great Britain uh, were intended to hurt any of the upstream countries. I don't think that was the case for a minute. Um, and, uh, you know, Egypt had the resources to be able to develop the Nile much more quickly than some of its upstream countries. Um, but, you know, that, that perception, of course, that they were able to develop first, they were able to use those resources first, and that we may, that may have caused um, challenges for us going forward. Um, look, this dam might reflect uh, a, a righting of some of those wrongs. It might reflect a more balanced approach, uh, not just to how the water is managed, but also to power dynamics within the region. And so, yeah, the dam means a lot. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how those issues play out. I agree with that <laughs> entirely. Um, okay, so we have another question from Julia Gay, uh, who's a asking about um, if you could explain what interest the U.S. has in its involvement um, with the Gare dispute or why, you know, American citizens should be concerned about 
this conflict. And I, I think, you know, maybe, you know, you have the ability to leverage, you know, um, having served under several different US administrations where Ethiopia has always, has been a high priority country, so has Egypt. Um, you know, this whole region has been, um, you know, listed, you know, within State Department um, as, you know, more, more prioritized than other parts, you know, of the world at times. Yeah, um, you know, I can't speak for the US government today and what its positions and views might be, but, but, but look, I, I would argue that this is one of the, um, you know, poorest, most conflict prone regions of the world. And that cooperative development around the Nile is an opportunity to strengthen economic development, to strengthen regional ties and to advance peace and security. Um, and I think if I were the US administration today, those would all be goals that I'd want to see happen in this region for a, for a whole host of re reasons. You know, number one, we spend, you know, every five years, we spend billions of dollars of humanitarian assistance in responding to droughts, uh, water management challenges, food security challenges within this region. We spend many millions of dollars responding to terrorist organizations, um, uh, you know, El Shabaab incursions and, and instability um, throughout the region. We have great concerns about the stability of the Red Sea and what that means with our GCC partners and everybody else. Uh, and so if you can, you know, I, I, I've said this before, you know, I, I, if Egypt and Ethiopia uh, can find their way to developing a cooperative relationship, not just on the Nile, but across a range of issues, I, I personally believe they can transform this region. Um, and I think those, those two countries could um, turn the Horn of Africa into a beacon of growth and development, peace and security. And I, I think that's something that every American should be uh, happy to try to support at this point. Great. We've had um, a few questions come in about the African Union and its role. Um, and, you know, everything from, you know, um, you know, the role it's playing, whether, you know, having it shift um, from out, you know, from the US, from DC, uh, you know, the World Bank to um, the African Union, um, will that help, you know, calm the tension between the three countries? Will it allow for different types of um, solutions that could be proposed? You know, why is there, um, you know, what would be the, are there any advantages for the African Union to be involved? Uh, you know, I, I think so, in part because it's the, um, uh, it's the UN body, so to speak, that's closest to the problem. And, and, you know, you'd rather see this problem addressed within an African Union context, for example, rather than the UN Security Council, if it can be. Um, you know, because, you know, you're, you're, again, you're closer and you've got folks with more experience in the region who understand the problems of the region, the dynamics of the region. Um, so I, th I think for those reasons, it's true. Um, but also, you know, there was a, a, a sorry, there was a, um, uh, an inkling in that question of something that I also want to kind of nip in the bud, um, because I've seen this a lot by people who are writing about the GERD and about this current problem. Um, and, and they're really militarizing this problem and weaponizing the Nile. And, and I don't see the countries themselves doing that. I think they're outside. You know, I'm seeing authors and scientists and academics writing these articles about the, you know, there's going to be a war over this and this is all going to happen and everything else. Um, I, I have never heard that from the countries, right? Um, and I've worked with them for many, many, many years. Um, there is no question in, in my, you know, in, in my mind um, that, uh, you know, Ethiopia uh, is, they do, I, I completely, support and believe that when they say um, they're not going to, uh, they have no intention of creating any harm downstream. I, I completely agree. I think that is absolutely true. I don't think there is any intent by Ethiopia to cause harm downstream. I, I also don't think there's any intention of Egypt to go to war with Ethiopia over this. I think all the parties want to find a positive way forward here. Um, and, I, and I think they will. Uh, but but I, I think we on the outside have to be careful about using this, um, 
uh, military, perhaps warmongering language around this issue, because I'm not sure that that's appropriate. And, it, and, and in some respects, I actually think it's not respectful either to the countries and to the people who've really um, worked very, very hard to try to solve this problem. You know, again, I've worked very closely with a number of people from all the countries who spent their careers um, working with their neighbors to try to get to solutions here. And uh, I think it's easy to oversimplify that and to not be respectful of that. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask you about um, international law since it hasn't come up really um, in our discussion yet or in the Q&A. Um, though we do have, you know, one, qu um, one question um, from Matthew Gallagher that was asking about, you know, um, the best comparative model and such as, you know, the Mekong River Commission. But often in international river basins, you find a lot of international water lawyers who would put forth that there's certain, you know, principles of internet, um, you know, of international law for how best to manage um, a shared water body. And, you know, if you only abided by, you know, equitable, reasonable use, um, you know, you could solve these problems. And so I'm just wondering, you know, from your perspective and having been involved in many different instances of international river basins, to what extent um, does international law matter, what, you know, and, and if so, you know, why and under what circumstances, you know, um, should um, the parties turn to look to international law for guidance? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, and so th there is a debate as to whether or not there truly is any international water law. Um, there is a UN convention uh, and, and, and of course, the UN Convention has a title which um, almost nobody can actually remember uh, from, from, from rope, but it, it's the UN Convention on the Law of the Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses. It was drafted in 1997. It took 17 years for this convention to enter into force. And when it entered into force, what you found was there was a, an interesting pattern to its ratification that the northern countries would ratify the treaty, southern countries wouldn't ratify the treaty, or in specific basins, there were almost no basins outside of Europe where you'd have every country ratify that agreement. And so because of that, it would be very hard to say that this is a treaty that reflects international common law, so to speak, on, on water. And therefore, it could be used as a a legally binding set of principles in adjudicating disputes like this. Now, that said, it does embody um, some very sound principles of practice that many countries and many people working on water support. The idea of equitable use and significant harm, and we can talk about what those actually mean, um, as, as principles to help guide the resolution of water problems. And there is nothing stopping individual countries from using those principles to guide their process in developing their own agreement around transboundary water or for even adjudicating disputes around transboundary water. Because what we know is the International Court of Justice, you know, they, they, they're not going to walk blindly into a water problem and say, is somebody just going to go to them and say, here, can you solve this? Um, they're going to say, what are, the, what, what are the principles? What's the scope of review? What is it that I can use to see whether this is right or wrong? And you can point to the 97 Convention as guidance to help inform how you might solve some of those disputes. So while there isn't anything that we might point to as binding international water law, there is a pretty well-developed sense um, that we can, uh, of, of, um, of what's right and what's wrong around water that we could point to to help guide the solution a resolution of disputes and things like that. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a little bit messy, but those things are out there. And, and of course, in this particular case, you know, Ethiopia has said that they'd be very comfortable um, using the principles of equitable use and significant harm to uh, address the challenges around, around the GERD. Um, now, 
what equitable use and significant harm mean is often in the eyes of the beholder. And the key challenge to reconciling that is often historical use. How do we balance what some might be consider a longstanding historical right? If I've been using, if I've been using 10 billion cubic meters of water since the dawn of time, do I have a right to continue using that 10 billion cubic meters of water? My personal view is that you may have that right up until that right causes harm or significant harm on another party, at which case you, you need to reevaluate then that use. And it's the same thing with equitable use, that my use of water, if my use of water is prejudicing somebody else's use of causing significant harm somewhere else, then, then these things come into play. But what significant harm means is also different for the different parties. And, and these are very hard terms to define. You mentioned examples. Uh, my favorite example, and I apologize, I'm, I'm from the US, I, I love the IBWC, sorry, the, the um, International Boundary and Waters Commission that the United States have with Mexico. And the reason, the reason why I like it is the treaty has been in place for over 100 years, um, but we've, uh, the United States and Mexico have agreed to different operating principles of that agreement 320 some odd times. And so the agreement hasn't, it, it, the, the way that institution works has not remained fixed. It's evolved over time. And that's what all of our institutions on transboundary water have to be able to do. They need to be able to evolve to take into account the changing hydrology, the changing needs of the country, all the other things that we talked about. And I think the IBWC is actually probably the best reflection of how that adaptive process within an institution can work. Okay, so um, we have another um, question from, um, I heard it go, they keep moving on me. Um, it was, um, so there's been a few on engineering technology type solutions, and then there is one um, that Dennis Waswa raised um, no, I, um, I think he, maybe it was choice. Um, yes. Um, well, let me try to re, um, collect them, but it was all about, you know, whether this is really about politics or about, um, you know, is it, or can you have a technological engineering solution? Sort of, there's always been this tension too, about whether you could just, um, you know, if you like, right. especially in parts of the Middle East, if you had just had certain technology, you could just engineer your way out of a water crisis. Um, but there's all, as you were talking about with the Nile, there's all these historical uses. And so how do you balance, you know, um, these trade-offs, you know, between let's just introduce some form of a technological so solution rather than really looking at the political interests or historical use um, and just trying to, you know, right. how do you balance those competing um, perspectives? No, it's a good question. Um, the, you know, the, the technical data only gets you so far and you can define the technical parameters, but you know, the, the real question is what's behind the numbers and, and what do those numbers really mean to, to people? And what does it mean to the distribution of costs and benefits? And so, and I think the countries have come to a pretty common understanding of what the filling and operations of the stand can look like. You know, the real challenge comes, uh, you know, if there's a long-term drought and how do you distribute the costs and benefits during that long-term drought? And there's lots of numbers to describe that. You can look at all sorts of models about if the water levels, you know, if the precipitation goes down the following way, then the power production at um, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam would drop in the following way, that the power production at the High Aswan Dam down in Egypt would drop the following, agricultural production would drop the following way. Um, you can do all that math and all those calculations. Um, but at the end of the day, the question is, okay then, who bears the cost? If it stops raining in the Ethiopian highlands, who bears the cost? Is that, is that a cost to Egyptian, uh, Ethiopian power production? 
Is it a cost to uh, Sudanese agricultural production? Is it a cost to Egyptian agricultural and employment and, and everything else that goes on down? And so, and that, well, that, you know, has numbers associated with it. So you might call it a technical issue. At its heart, it really has a lot to do with politics. Um, and this is where I think the countries are stuck. And, and you know, I, I think there's some creative thinking that has to happen here, to be frank, um, in part because, you know, we deal with these kinds of decisions all the time, right? When we think about how much money we need to save for retirement and everything else. And, and we start to think about, oh, what if I, what if I get, you know, cancer when I'm, when I'm 65? And what's that going to cost me? And then I start to look at what a cancer treatment costs and I realize I can't afford that. It, you know, there's no way I can save up enough money to make that happen. And so I buy insurance. I try to insure myself against that type of an eventuality. And if it happens, well, then I have something I can fall back on. And I think we're gonna to have to be somewhat creative here. Um, we're gonna to have to come up with, with schemes that you know, allow parties to protect themselves against some of these climate related risks. And, and that's, it's gonna require some innovation. Um, but I think there are ways to do that. And I think that's not just technically driven. Again, I think there's a lot of social and cultural and political factors that, that all, go in, all go into that. There are other factors though, by the way, I, you know, again, um, having worked in the region for a long time, uh, there's a real conversation that these countries need to have around systematic inequalities, just like all of us. Um, you know, we're all going through an introspective process these days about what systematic inequalities means and what we've done and how our actions have had impacts on others that we didn't anticipate or necessarily want. And we're thinking about that deeply in the, in the water sector. Um, I think we need to think about that deeply in, in this region um, and, this, and on both sides, right? Because if I'm the victim of a systematic inequality, uh, you have to pay a lot of attention as to whether or not the, the party who did the action was really aware of what they were doing when they were doing it um, and allow them space to be able to work their way out of that. Um, at the same time, as, as you know, big actors who do things all the time, uh, we have to be very sensitive to how the things that we've done in the past may have set the stage for certain development outcomes now and start to accept that role and start to work to address some of those concerns. And, and that's a different kind of a conversation that's not rooted in technology at all that probably has to happen throughout the region. And just building off that, I think you're raising lots of um, really important points about um, inequities um, in the region, in, um, in access to water, um, access to energy in the region. Um, and, you know, we're, we're living in a period of a pandemic. Um, and we have a question um, from someone asking, how has COVID-19 impacted progress on negotiations as well as, as on the dam itself? But also, I mean, part of, you know, coping with, um, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is ensuring that people have access to being able to proper water, sanitation, and hygiene. So, you know, just reflecting a bit on you know, what that might mean moving forward for um, the Nile Basin states. You know, uh, I think COVID generally has um, helped to humanize a lot of processes. Um, you know, when we, when we talk to each other now, you know, the first thing we say, I hope you're well, I hope your family's well, you know, I hope everybody's okay. And so all of a sudden we're thinking about people and, and that's, that's always a good thing, especially in a very uh, tough negotiation process. It's easy for us to forget you know, that we're talking to, to, to people that, that whose lives are important and people that we care about. Um, the other is that uh, COVID has really pointed out systematic inequalities in a way that uh, we don't think about um, too often. The disproportionate impact in the United States that this disease has had on people of color um, has you know, been a huge wake up call for how we have not worked to create the systems that allow everyone to access the same types of healthcare, the same types of resources. And when you think about that now globally, you know, we're having those same types of thoughts now about countries and how what we've done might have enabled some countries to develop at the expense of other countries. 
and create large swaths of systematic inequalities that we need to seriously think about and reconsider. And so I, I actually think, you know, COVID has enlightened us in the water and in the world community to a lot of those kinds of issues. Um, you know, it's obviously changed the dynamics of the negotiations. Um, the good news is I think a lot of these folks who are talking to each other have known each other for a long time. And so going to Zoom hasn't been too much of a challenge, but you can imagine if you were going to Zoom with parties you didn't know and have good relationships with, that it could be a real challenge. And, and there is a lot of turnover in governments. And so you can imagine at the higher levels, when we need the prime ministers to be talking to each other, we need the foreign ministers to be talking to each other, and there's greater turnover, and that may complicate matters because that personal time with each other is important in humanizing the impacts of the decisions that they're gonna be making. So building upon the unique role that the United States has played at various times, um, there's a question too from Jawaline Patel. And what are your thoughts on the U.S. suspending foreign aid to Ethiopia um, and the broader implications um, of decisions like this for, you know, the geopolitics, but also for these bigger challenges of, you know, access to water, access to electricity, um, health care, um, a lot of the humanitarian assistance, but also for dealing with, you know, the U.S. has had a very strong um, presence in Ethiopia. You know drought risk. Um, so you know what are these the larger implications of the suspension of aid? Yeah, my personal opinion is that it, it, it makes no sense whatsoever uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the um, the suspension of uh, aid to look at uh, Ethiopia is in critical need of assistance. Um, that support means a lot to the people of Ethiopia and lives on the ground suspending that aid for the, because of the dam is, is not going to have, A, it's not going to have any impact. Uh, B, it may even harden the position of the Ethiopian people with respect to the current sets of negotiations and make it more difficult for us to get to an agreement. And C, at the very end, it actually looks a little bit spiteful um, because, oh, the U.S. process failed, so now guess what, the country's going to come to an agreement, we're going to go ahead and hold them responsible. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we'd see broad support for doing that. And I agree for all the reasons that the questioner raised about the importance of aid to Ethiopia. Now, that said, there's certainly very legitimate concerns about um, the backsliding of the democratic reforms, um, human rights issues that we may be seeing in Ethiopia. Um, and there's a need to continue a dialogue on those sets of issues. Um, but to suspend aid uh, over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, uh, that just doesn't make any sense to me. So we have um, a lot of questions wanting your big picture solution <laughs> um, to the dispute over the, the GERD. Um, you know, if countries didn't reach a deal, you know, what should happen, um, you know, be bold, you know, if you, I mean, and I know that's not who you are in trying, you know, in trying to insert yourself, but if you were to provide guidance from your experience, um, what would you want to say to um, those sitting at the table um, what, you know, any words of advice moving forward from where we are now? Very first for a second there. Um, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, I think if, if I had a magic wand, of course, what I would do is wish it was 50 years from now. Um, because, you know, I really think 50 years from now, all of this is going to look a lot different and we're going to be in a different place. And, and I actually have a lot of faith in the, um, uh, the, the younger folks that I've seen, the youth in Egypt, the youth in Ethiopia, the youth in Sudan, um, in their vision and uh, that they have uh, for, for the future of these countries. And so I, I, I think that if I, could, if, if I could wave a magic wand, that's what I would do. And, and we'd be 50 years later down the road, we'd have a fully functioning dam, we'd have a different sets of relationships and communications going on between the countries. Um, I, 
you know, I I do um, you know I I do worry that uh, the dam will be a source of tension that will take uh, resources, and by that I mean um, you know uh, people but also emotional energy away from the building, the kinds of relationships that we need to see happen in that region. Um, You know, we need to see the sanctions being dropped in Sudan and Sudan getting on the path to strong economic recovery. Um, You know, we need to see Ethiopia becoming a a leader on the continent in economic growth and development, right? Uh, We need to see Egypt taking steps to uh, move away from a water based uh, agricultural country and becoming more water secure, um, but becoming a full partner with those other countries and being able to advance economic development and growth. Um, But more than that, we need to see, um, and and I know this is hard coming from the United States right now, um, but, but, you know, we we need to see a, uh, you know, a resetting of relationships uh, between these countries. And um, I think we need to come to terms with the past what colonialism meant to the Horn of Africa and what the legacies of colonialism are. Uh, We need to come to terms with our own personal and country level engagements in the region and the reasons we did them, the way we did them and what all the perverse impacts of that were. And we need to have a real conversation about how we begin to move forward given all that baggage and everything else that's happened. And so, you know, from my perspective, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we can find ways to stimulate conversations between uh, you know, Ethiopians, Egyptians, and Sudanese in new ways. Uh, so they, they, they can begin to discover some shared interests. They can begin to discover their shared aspirations for the region. Uh, and they can d- begin to work together across a range of issues. And I think GERD and water will be just one of them. Um, that's a long-term process. It's not going to solve GERD in the next um, uh, couple of years. Um, but what we're seeing is, is, you know, a stepwise process. Uh, we're going to work incrementally through this. Uh, Ethiopia is going to continue to fill the dam. Uh, the, the terms and the conditions they'll try to lay out, and hopefully we can come to maybe short-term agreements on what that might look like on an annual basis, um, but that the conversation is continuing between them in, in good faith, um, just to ensure that, um, that, that they can minimize the potential impacts and maximize the potential benefits among all the countries. And so for me, it's about you know, maintaining a healthy dialogue process um, about how, how we get the best of this and how we reduce the harms. Uh, whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen right now. Look, the dam's getting built, the dam's gonna go up, the dam's gonna get filled, the dam's gonna operate. So now the question is, okay, how do we start to work together to make sure um, that all the things that we wanna have happen with this can happen? And sorry, that was very long winded. No, no, no. I mean, this is an opportunity. It's wonderful to hear you reflect. Um, You know, there's often people who don't get to sit at the table when decisions are being made over water. Um, You know, in many cases, women aren't at the table who often, you know, have different needs for access to water. And I'm just wondering, as we start to wind down a bit, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about national interests, Egypt's national interests, Sudan, Ethiopia, but are there other interests that need to be taken into account in thinking about managing the Nile, thinking about the Gerd, but also, you know, um, also there's a larger number of riparians that are party to the Nile. And, you know, what about some of the other upstream states? Yeah, no, no, you're right. Um, they're all stakeholders, uh, and they should all have a kind of a, a role in that process. But this is really tough, right? This is, um, you know, does everybody have an equal role? Does everybody have an equal say? Um, because not all riparians are equal, right? Ethiopia is at the headwaters. Egypt is a downstream riparian. Sudan is stuck in the middle. Um, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, all the other upstream countries. Um, there's all sorts of different interests and different, different, different um, uh, ways forward. I, you know, I think you, you don't want to overcomplicate a process. And so when you're talking about the operation of the Blue Nile, that's between Egypt, Ethiopia, and Sudan. Uh, when you're talking about the, the principles and how you might develop infrastructure on the broader Nile, then indeed you have to include all those different um, countries as stakeholders. 
but you've raised a good issue, uh, issue which is how do we get, um, you know, how does the general public uh, in these countries be, you know, weigh in? How are their views reflected in these processes? Um, how do we ensure that views are being represented fairly and equally? Um, and that's the goal of the Nile Basin Initiative, uh, is to help bring those voices into the discussion processes between the countries. Um, and you know, there's different ways to do that. Uh, the one thing you do have to be careful is that it, it's often uh, the case in any transboundary water situation where myths will dominate the discourse. And so there's a, a lot of work to be done by scientists to help inform and keep the, the public um, well-educated uh, as much as you can uh, to help involve the countries in data collection processes uh, so that you can create a common understanding of the challenges and opportunities that exist and that all the stakeholders have an opportunity to work in that process together. I have to unmute. Um, you answered one of the last questions that we had was, you know, wanting some more reflections on the Nile Basin initiative. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I just, you know, wanna turn this over to you. To Sorry, can I just go back to that for a quick second? Yes, because I do. I do worry about the Nile Basin Initiative, and you know there was another question that talked about the Mekong, perhaps as an example. The MRC is an example of a basin institution. Um, and it, it, there's a real question as to whether um, you know what the role of a river basin organization should be. And there are better minds than I who think about this. Is Ann Schmeier is one of them, and there's a bunch of others who think about you know, how basin organizations work. Um, but there can be an inherent conflict of interest in a basin organization that is run and managed by governments with the development of uh, pro development projects and investments. And so you have to be a little bit careful. And, and you know, I, I do worry about the Nile Basin Initiative in this regard because it's easy for them to go down the same route that the Mekong River Commission went down. The Mekong River Commission became a tool of donor governments and they tried to turn it into a development agency. And, and that wasn't the goal of the MRC. The goal of the MRC was to be a platform for joint problem solving. And that joint problem solving function, because nobody pays for that part, right? The, the MRC would get money for doing development projects. And so they could sustain themselves if they did development projects. So there was this perverse incentive for the MRC to work more on development projects rather than on, on the governance aspects. And so that created a real tension within the MRC and, and, they, and they moved away from doing some of those core governance functions. I fear the same thing on the Nile. And there's no question that the NBI, um, that the political conversations going on around the NBI have hampered the NBI's ability to do capacity building, to do joint modeling and joint planning and joint development activities and all that other kind of stuff. And so there may be, you know, I, I, I strongly, think that the governments should, and you know, when we, I was really fortunate to be part of the conversations when we had the 10 ministers sitting down, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, envisioning what an MDI could look like and what that would look, but we're 20 years down the road now. And we should be sitting down and having another conversation about what does the right structure for a river basin organization look like for the Nile? And is it combining both government and non-governmental functions together? Or do we need to kind of separate those two and, and provide a little bit of autonomy for certain functionalities? You know, the United States, we have two different examples. The International Joint Commission, the commission that we have with uh, Canada, um, you know, that's a completely different animal than the Boundary Commission that we have with Mexico. You know, the Boundary Commission with Mexico can take binding decisions. You know, they can, they can take resolutions that bind both governments to actions. The International Joint Commission can only make recommendations to the two governments, that the two governments then can sit down and either agree to or not agree to. And those are different models. And there's real benefits sometimes to that separation of the technical process and the political process. And I think we have to go back and rethink that with regards to the Nile, with regard to the NBI and its future. Sorry. No, that was excellent because I was hoping that you would, you know, take the opportunity to jump in on anything that we've missed. Um, and, you know, there's been a number of questions asking for the alternative models um, and also asking, you know, 
really for you to, um, you know, what comes next, really. Um, and so we're right at time. And I just want to see if there's anything that we didn't cover that you would like, um, you know, just to add before we sign off for today. Um, but I hope this, these will be conversations that we can continue, um, given that there's lots of water basins and you often talk about the big six. So we've only talked about one of them today, um, but there's room to have- Could these we have a regular series. <laughs> what? We could have a regular series. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, you know, is there anything else that you would like to add just you know, that we might have missed. Um, you know, again, just maybe a, a note of caution, because I know, again, everybody's running to publish their paper on why these countries are going to go to war. Um, I, I, again, I, I don't think um, that's in the cards for these countries. I, I just don't think it's, it's there. Um, I, I, the people I know all want to work towards a peaceful solution of this. Um, there are some really difficult questions that are still out there. and. Um, you know, my hope is that the parties will be creative and think about some new ways of resolving them. But also, you know, um, th there's a lot of relationship building that has to happen outside of water. And, and I hope the parties will engage in that too. And maybe we'll be able to get some more positive at the end of the day. I hope so too. I think, you know, I mean, the fact that, you know, um, I don't want to be, be cliche, but you know, water does bring people together in many ways. And hopefully, you know, we will continue to have these conversations and to invite people from the region to join us. Um, and with that, um, I want to thank you, Aaron, for taking the time. Thanks, Erica. Um, this has been wonderful. I want to thank, um, you know, UNC's Middle East Center for um, offering me the opportunity to moderate this conversation. Um, to Shai and Emma who are behind the scenes making this happen and to all the participants for um, joining us today. And with that, um, I hope everyone has a lovely end of the week and a safe and health and stay safe and healthy um, in the foreseeable future. Bye.